40 participants. Alan, you're still on mute. Hi, I, I haven't, I mean, Howard, I can't hear you though. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, just okay. now. Yeah, I probably introduced myself while I was on mute. So that that's a, a good start, but you go ahead. All right, well, thank you. And welcome everybody on this beautiful evening. Um, I'm I, Alan Branhig. Morning. It's a different person, but <laughs> I can hear I can hear background side. Yeah, sounds, I'm trying so to I, I'm trying to quiet them down as as I hear them. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, welcome everybody on this beautiful uh, late winter, I guess we'll call it evening here. Um, beautiful highs in the 50s today, and I'm coming live from my office at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, and here we're we're going to talk about um butterflies and let's see i hope this is the right screen share can you see my powerpoint now Howard? yes yes fantastic all right so i hope everyone knows um lepidoptera are butterflies and moths and i like to lump them together um, I'm making the introduction. That's they, they are the um scaled wing insects um, and actually the fourth most diverse uh, family of insects on the planet. The Hymenoptera, the bees and wasps um, and ants are actually the most diverse now. Um, they just passed uh, beetles, Coleoptera, and of course flies are third. So an amazingly diverse group of insects. And of course, all of them have scaled wings. When you rub the wings of a moth or a butterfly and you see that dust, that those are the scales that are um, over the tops of the wings. And of course, they have a complete metamorphosis. And that is really um, critical as a gardener to know about. Um, you know, they have an egg, a caterpillar, and a pupa, which a chrysalis for most of the um, butterflies. And many of our moths actually make cocoons. I think everyone knows that the silk, silking. Uh, uh, protective coating, and of course the adult 
uh, moth or butterfly. Um, the technical term is the imago. And I know tonight's program, you really asked me to, to try to focus on the caterpillar stage and host plants in your garden. Um, but I always like to point out that butterflies actually are a subset of the moth family tree. But butterflies are technically moths, just that uh, virtually all of them, except one, one group in Central America are active in the day. And of course, moths, most are active at night, but we have a lot of day day flying ones. And of course, I like that the Greek word for butterfly is psyche. Um, and they literally thought that butterflies transported our soul to heaven. So um, here we go. So here are some caterpillars um, that I've just found locally um, to get started, mostly to talk about some of their adaptations. On the upper left, the one that looks like a little bird dropping, that's a little um, first instar of the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail butterfly. And I think everyone knows the lower left one is a monarch. And it has that kind of bright yellow, white, black coloration. And of course, it is a toxic caterpillar gaining the toxins from the milkweed and those warning colorations, birds um, learn to avoid it. Whereas the swallowtail caterpillar, they just think it's a bird dropping. So that's how they avoid it. The upper middle is the milkweed tussock moth. Um, I think most of you who've grown milkweed have seen little herds of these. They look like little schnauzers. Um, their really fine coat of hairs actually is a protective deterrence on them. And the lower middle is a unexpected cysnia uh, caterpillar. That's another moth that is a milkweed specialist. And I took that picture in, in Eden Prairie on the prairie remnants there. And its bright orange coloration is, it's a warning warning coloration, just like the monarch, it, it has the toxins. And on the right, again, cryptic. Um, I hope you can see the caterpillar in the middle there. I think you can see my cursor, but that is a fawn sphinx caterpillar on an ash, an understory ash in my backyard woods. And I love how you know the patterning on it makes it just blend in so beautifully with the leaves. So again, trying to hide so that birds don't eat it because I think as we all know from bringing nature home and so on, how important most caterpillars are to feeding songbirds. Um, I'll do a little quick on my opening soapbox. Um, you know, butterflies are really uh, in decline in many areas, especially the core of the Midwest. You over on the east side of the metro, more away from um, the corn and soybean belt are in better shape. And of course, northern Minnesota is in good shape and the Ozarks are in good shape. But um, butterfly declines are just um, almost tragic here in the southwestern metro area of the Twin Cities. Um, I think people have, I don't know if you read the book, The Moth Snowstorm, but you know, um, used to when I was young, you'd have to clean off the windshield when you drive at night because you'd hit so many flying insects. And of course, that is no more. We do have research. Um, Ohio butterfly surveys was one of the best showing declines. Um, and my home county in Winnishik, Iowa, which is right off the southeastern corner of Minnesota, um, you know, they, there's actually a professor at Luther College that has done surveys. Um, based on uh, original naturalist, um, Bert Porter, who, who did that in 1908 and found 73 species of butterflies in that county. And at their, last, their last survey that I have information on was in 2015 and they could only find 42 species in the county. Um, we think some of these issues are pesticide misuse. The biggest um, killer in, in our area is the soybean aphid aerial spraying drift from fields. And of course, um, soybean aphids are able to overwinter and be such a pest to the farmers because their host plant is buckthorn, our invasive buckthorn. So if we can do more to remove buckthorn, we actually will reduce soybean aphid pressure. Uh, of course, mosquito homeowner uh, spraying, um, the, the mosquito joes of the world, I can't say how toxic that is, um, but there's definitely a noticeable paucity of butterflies in the Twin Cities. Um, and of course, you know, several species are really in trouble now. Um, Ozark swallowtail has not been seen in years and probably I have the last photograph of one from my actual yard in Missouri, um, Florida leafwing on the verge of extinction. And probably you know about the Powashik skipperling here in Minnesota, uh, extirpated from the state. It's tipping point, it just disappeared. There's just in Manitoba and uh, I believe Michigan are the last 
little populations. And luckily the Minnesota Zoo is trying to save them. And of course, kudos to all you and wild ones, because as you can see, um, you know, reducing lawn is probably the biggest thing you can do. And, um, you know, of course, today we're here really to focus on host plants and planting the things that the caterpillars feed on, um, because obviously that is a, a critical step. Um, but you do also have to, have, of course, have the nectar plants um, for the adult butterflies or moths to feed on. And then, of course, you know, you have to have a place for them to overwinter. These things don't disappear. They're out there right now. And, you know, if you raked up all your leaves um, and, you know, you over clean up your yard, you're, of course, um, inadvertently destroying these creatures. And we'll go in a little more detail on that. So I think everyone in Wild Ones is familiar with how important these things are to the web of life. And, um, and, and even on the right there, that wasp uh, having a caterpillar um, for, for dinner, we know how important the whole web of life is. Um, but specifically on butterflies, I want to I want to talk about there are different types of butterflies. And for us as mostly wild one member wild ones members who are trying to garden in our own yards we are really dealing with the generalist species of butterflies that are not habitat restricted and um, the painted lady is a classic one of a butterfly in that group which i think everyone is familiar with on the right um, is a habitat specialist the eyed brown it is really completely tied to uh, marshes and sedge meadows and fens and more natural communities. Um, if you have a home that abuts up to a pretty nice wetland, you may get this butterfly in your garden, but otherwise, um, you know, you, you, would, you would never see it. Um, there's also um, colonists and migrant butterflies versus our red resident butterflies. And on the left, the painted lady who I said, you know, of course is not habitat restricted. It's a generalist, but it's also a migrant. And of course, the monarch on the far left of that picture is a migrant. Uh, we all know where they spent the winter. And actually, I just uh, in February I got to go uh, see them on the wintering grounds in uh, Michoacan, Mexico. Um, the difference between a monarch and a painted lady in migration is, of course, monarchs actually do come back all the way to the heart of the Midwest um, from Mexico, whereas painted ladies fly south to survive the winter, mostly in the Sonoran Desert, and then you know, breed and, and depending on the rains in the southwestern deserts, um, new um, generations of that butterfly return. And of course, after a big bloom in the southwest, we can have literally thousands of these in Minnesota that following summer as they spread back uh, north. But they do not, neither of those butterflies are hardy and cannot survive our winter. So it doesn't matter what you do in your garden um, in the winter because they, they're gone. Uh, the buckeye is a um, colonist butterfly that also survives further south and spreads up into our region um, in the summertime. And of course, there's vagrant butterflies, ones that are just kind of blown off course. The funereal dusky wing on the left, the first one was ever found in Minnesota, was um, at um, found in Mendota, actually, here in the, in the Twin Cities a, a couple of years ago. And the cloudless sulfur is a big, big tropical yellow sulfur that is starting to show up more, especially in Southeast Minnesota um, with our more hot, humid summers. But our butterflies can be classified into five uh, basic families, the swallowtails, which I think most people know, big and showy, the sulfurs and whites, gossamers, which are mostly are these very small and colorful, usually colorful. Uh, the brush-footed butterflies, they're called that because the uh, two front legs are little unusable brushes. So the monarch is in that group. If you've ever held a monarch, I mean, you, we all know insects have six legs, but how many legs grab onto you when you're holding a monarch? Just four, because again, the front two legs um, are these little brush-like uh, appendages. And then, of course, skippers. And uh, swallowtails um, overwinter as a chrysalis. And they always, every, every species uh, creates this little saddle around their middle. And you can see the, the chrysalis here on the side of my house. Um, and they're usually very cryptic um, on bark or twigs or stems or rocks. And yes, that's how they survive the winter. All our swallowtails are out there right now. Um, and of course, won't emerge until we get some consistently warm weather, usually in May in this area. 
keep going to the specific swallowtails. Um, the most common um, swallowtail that actually is doing pretty well in the Twin Cities is the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. Um, you over there on the east side of the metro in the St. Croix River and going north and east, we actually have another species that's very similar, the Canadian uh, Tiger Swallowtail as well. Um, but this is the most common one in the bulk of the metro. And um, it has a yellow form with the tiger stripes. This is the female form that's black and blue, and it's part of this um, mimicry complex of toxic black and blue swallowtails, mainly the pipevine swallowtail, which we don't have specifically in this area very often, but this whole uh, mimicry complex, uh, birds still learn on migration or wherever to not mess with black and blue butterflies like that. And I love this picture on the right. One of the volunteers here sent this picture to me and I'm like, oh my God, that is a um, bilateral dimorphic female. In other words, half of her is a light phase female and half of her is a dark phase female. And if you want the tiger swallowtail, the critical host plants for its caterpillars are black cherry, our ash trees and with emerald ash borer. Um, of course, we don't recommend you to really plant those anymore, but luckily this species uh, can feed on other things. Uh, also um, for further okay. south, tulip trees, magnolias, and the hop tree no. um, will also work for the Eastern tiger swallowtail. It's interesting, the, Canadians, the Canadian tiger swallowtail will feed on the black cherry and the ash, but it will literally die. It will not feed on those other more Southern uh, trees. Um, the black swallowtail is really well known. Um, people say I have monarch caterpillars on my parsley and then you immediately know, well, those aren't monarch caterpillars, they are um, black swallowtails, um, which um, it is a native butterfly, but uh, many of our butterflies have actually changed their host plants to imported plants and almost exclusively. Um, black swallowtails almost never use native plants anymore. They really like parsley dill and fennel and parsnips and a lot of these weedier species. Um, though occasionally you still will find them on some of our native carrot family plants like the golden alexanders and the great angelica. I've seen the caterpillars on both those plants. Um, they have three broods and the left is a male and the um, right one is a female. And you may think, aha, that looks a lot like that female dark faced tiger swallowtail. And that is precisely it. It's part of that mimicry complex um, to avoid predation by birds. Um, we have a new uh, kind of a newer resident swallowtail in the area, the giant swallowtail. Um, its caterpillars can feed only on prickly ash or plants in the citrus family. So that's almost exclusively, well, our only native plant is the prickly ash in that group. Um, it really is one of the largest butterflies in the Midwest. Um, if you go into Southeast Minnesota, south of Chatfield, um, this is a very common butterfly. So where I grew up in Northeast Iowa, sometimes this is the most common swallowtail. Um, on many summers, which is pretty interesting. And it's, it's a neat recent adaptation. Um, I'm probably talking about too much, but it, it is interesting that this was a tropical butterfly not that long ago, and literally one gene on it flipped to make it a hardy butterfly. And now it, it will overwinter even into Minnesota, which is pretty amazing. Um, and of course in Florida, they hate this plant, this butterfly, because its caterpillars do feed on citrus. Um, and can be a pest in orange groves. Um, the next family are the whites, sulfurs, and yellows. Um, the cabbage white on the left, I think most of you uh, know, that is one of our few non-native butterflies um, from Europe, and of course a pest on cabbage and, and related plants like you know broccoli um, and any, anything in the cabbage family, Brussels sprouts, um, kale. Um, here's a native white, the mustard white in the center. Um, you over, especially on the east side of the metro, may have that more commonly. Um, this picture was taken last spring at the Arboretum, the first one we've ever seen here at the Arboretum. Um, it must have native um, mustard family plants, native woodland mustard family plants to, to survive. And on the right is the little yellow, um, a summer colonist species of, of uh, sulfur that um, its host plant is partridge pea. 
And of course, the most common of this group are the clouded sulfur on the, on the left, which are the common yellow sulfurs, and the orange sulfur on the right, which is the one that is a little more cantaloupe color. I don't have pictures of them with their wings open because um, they, they never open their wings when they're nectaring or, or resting, so I don't, I don't have pictures of them. And it's interesting, the orange sulfur on the right, when I was young, was really more of a colonist butterfly, but now it's become way more common. And I, I think we're, we're really thinking that it somehow does overwinter even here in the upper Midwest, which is pretty interesting. So things are changing. Um, the next family are the gossamer butterflies. Um, they're the, the little jewels. Um, they all have a caterpillar that's very slug-like. That picture in the middle is actually of a Henry's elfin, which um, is more of, usually more of a southern species, but has this weird Wisconsin population that does get, uh, I don't know if anyone in your group has seen one along the St. Croix River. Um, it's one of our earliest butterflies to come out in the spring. Um, but eastern tail blue on the left, that's a, you know, grossly enlarged butterfly. It's really almost no bigger than my thumbnail. And, but what a beauty with those shimmering blue um, scales on its wings and has little tails and these little orange eyes. And when it sits like this, it actually rubs its wings together. And research has finally shown what it's doing is it's actually protecting itself from mostly from predatory spiders. The spiders think that this is the actual head and, and oftentimes the butterfly can get away, which is kind of interesting. And the caterpillars are, uh, of these are often ant tended, which is kind of interesting as well. Um, Eastern tail blue is another one that native plants, it's really switched almost exclusively to, you know, clovers in the lawn and clovers in a field or on a, you know, ed, uh, um, you know, edge of a woods or something. And, and it will use um, some of our native legumes as well. We also have the spring and summer azures. Um, hopefully one of the first butterflies to come out is the spring azure, which has these really exquisite uh, blue, um, at least the upper wing, they're, they're all kind of silvery underneath. This is actually a summer azure on the right there on some scat on a boardwalk. Um, but you can tell they're a lot lighter, a lighter blue. Um, the interesting thing is the spring azure comes out only in spring and um, the caterpillar emerges and feeds really exclusively on dogwood, various like pagoda dogwood and round leaf dogwood and red twig dogwood on the, on the flower buds and then pupates and doesn't emerge until uh, the, the following spring, which is pretty amazing. The summer azure will feed on various um, shrub flowers, everything from New Jersey tea to nanny berry to dogwoods as well, but it has multiple broods through the, the, the summer season. And I've seen them in my garden as late as October, but still the caterpillars, uh, they can feed on the fruits of those plants and, and still overwinters at a, as a caterpillar. Um, the hair streaks also in this group, a lot of them are just like little living gems. You got to look at them close with the various markings on them. And they also have like the eastern tail blue, the tail with the fake eyes, and then they, they rub those back wings together to make, make it look like this is the active end. And again, research is showing that that is an adaptation to um, protection from predatory spiders mainly. Um, the banded hair streak, very common. That's one butterfly that, that still is doing well, even here in the Southwest Metro. Whoops, excuse me, um, feeds on oaks um, mainly. And the Edwards hair streak in the middle, another um, usually scrub oaks and savannas. Hey, you for the St. Croix oak savanna, that should be a classic butterfly in oak savannas. It's about the only place I see it. I can get banded hair streaks in my yard, but I've never had an Edwards hair streak in my yard. Um, but I've seen them in the savannas down in the refuge. Um, and the olive juniper hair streak, if you have red cedars, that's its only uh, host plant. And that's a picture from my front yard last summer. Uh, we have the coppers in this group. Um, all of them feed on uh, docks. So sometimes some of our weedy plants that we don't consider uh, good garden plants are really critical to these things. And of course, some of our docks are really quite beautiful and I like the winter seed heads of the fruits on them. Um, 
water dock to me is a really exquisite wetland plant and of course a native. So um, don't knock the docks if you wanna have these um, interesting uh, butterflies, three species here, the American bronzed and purplish coppers. And of course, I, to keep time, I'm gonna have to go fairly fast. Um, we have the brush-footed butterflies. Again, this is the one, the group that have the four active legs that the monarch is in. Um, and most of them are in these orange tones. And here are a couple of the most common ones. Um, the pearl crescent, one of our small, really small butterflies. Again, it's only a couple inches across and its caterpillar feeds on asters and the caterpillar overwinters as a little tiny, um, you know, first or second instar caterpillar. So there's one, if you have asters, you know, don't rake the leaves and stuff around them. That's the only way that caterpillar can survive the winter. And then of course in the spring, it, uh, you know, comes out of hibernation and starts feeding on the new growth of the asters. And actually by, um, it's amazing, by May, you may already have pearl crescents um, already um, starting to come out by the end of the month. The silvery checker spots, very, very closely related. And it feeds on anything in, in the aster family, but likes things like sunflowers and even ragweeds. And I've had it actually, herds of its little caterpillar there on the right, the little black guy there is one of its caterpillars, uh, defoliate my purple cone flowers. Um, though, um, you know, it isn't, it isn't that common um, in the metro, not as common as further south. The picture on the left, I actually took in Anoka County and I have now seen it in um, Carver County. Um, so, um, but if you plant those aster plants, it is one that you can have in your yard. Both these you can have in your yard. Then we have the great spangled fritillary, one of our larger showy butterflies. Um, and it is exclusively tied to violets and only native violets. It will not feed on like the non-native sweet violet that gardeners sometimes plant. Um, the caterpillar overwinters as absolutely, I mean, it emerges from its egg in the fall and then overwinters. And then in the spring, when the violets start growing, the caterpillar becomes active and searches out violets to feed on. And usually by early June, um, they emerge as the butterflies with just one cycle through the entire summer. So this is a, an absolute critical um, to have violets in your yard. And again, not to rake up the leaves because that's where the little caterpillars are spending the winter. Um, this one, I, it, I finally colonized my yard in Jaska. I'm thrilled. I had um, some female butterflies here. I got a picture, I guess, from um, actually, this is from my Missouri garden. I would, I could actually identify different females, very long lived. Again, they'll come out in June and the, the males, they'll mate and the males die off, but the females live well into fall. Um, very, very long lived butterfly. And I could start to identify the various ones because of how the bird attacks the different how how, the, how much of their wings they had left. But um, these females are laying actually tons and tons of eggs, um, actually willy nilly. And it's, it, you know, in my garden in Missouri, I had widespread violets and I'm getting to that here in Minnesota. And if you do that, you, you can get colonies of this great spangled fritillary in your yard. Um, the ad admirals are in this family and they are mimics. I think the right one is the viceroy. Everyone knows what that mimics, of course, the monarch. And V is for viceroy. So you see this cross line that makes a V here in the, in the hind wing. That's a good identification feature from the monarch, though, of course, it um, is usually smaller. Um, and it, its host plant are willows. And then the red spotted purple on the left um, from where you're at and north and east um, is the white admiral, which has these big white bands on it. But in most of the metro now, we have the red spotted purple form and black and blue. Hmm, what's going on again? Again, it's a mimic of that swallowtail complex. Um, so birds learn to avoid eating these black and purple um, black and blue uh, butterflies, even though this one is edible. Um, its host plants are, uh, I've seen it um, using cottonwood, but usually it's more plums and hawthorn and serviceberry, things in the rose family. And these overwinter as a caterpillar. And on the left, that's one overwintering. Um, the, the, the young caterpillars in the fall 
um, will eat most of a leaf, but leave the midrib, and then it's used its silk to tie that remnant of the leaf on the plant. And in that little sleeping bag is this little caterpillar, and that's what survives the winter. So you got to really watch how you're pruning if you have willows or cottonwoods or service berries or hawthorns and you have this butterfly around. But that's what you need to do to keep that uh, coming back. And then it has two broods. Uh, in the spring, one emerges, well, in early summer and has a, you know, a caterpillar that makes a chrysalis and emerges again in late summer. And it's those late summer butterflies, the, cat the little caterpillars from those that overwinter for the next year. Um, we have hackberry emperors. Uh, last year, especially south of the Twin Cities in the Midwest was a, a huge boom year for them. In Southern Minnesota and Northeast Iowa, there were literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of these out. Um, here in the Twin Cities, we had good numbers of them. Um, they're kind of a, a speckly brown butterfly that is not really that striking, but it's one of the most friendly butterflies that often will land on you to, to get sweat. But its host plant is literally hackberry and nothing else. And it's another one that overwinters as a caterpillar. And if you don't have a mulch area with leaf litter for the caterpillars to overwinter under your hackberry, again, you, you know, it will not survive the winter. And then, of course, in the spring, the caterpillar crawls back up on the plant uh, to feed. I have a picture of the tawny emperor. It's a very, a very similar species, mostly found uh, on the southern edge in southern Minnesota, southern edge of the metro. It looks very similar, it's just more orange. And this picture, I had to put it in here. On my butterfly feeder, I had a, a hackberry emperor and a tawny emperor mating, which interspecies activity there, which isn't supposed to be. But anyway, um, the lady butterflies, the painted lady, again, I already talked about overwintering in the southwest, um, usually feeding on thistles and mallows. Our native um, thistles are absolutely great host plants for it. The red admiral on the right is also in, you know, they actually are the same genus, have the exact same wing shape, um, but red admirals feed on nettles. And so there's a reason to have a little nettle patch, though, of course, we do have the false nettle, which doesn't sting you that you could plant as a host plant for it as well. Uh, red admirals also, do not survive the winter in this area. Um, they they kind of emigrate from further south each year. And on good years, a lot of them can immigrate um, north and in, in the springtime you can get, um, well, you can notice notice them moving north, flying, flying north. Uh, the question mark, these are butterflies called angle wings, um, two forms, in the one that comes out in the summer um, that, uh, overwinters from that overwinters as excuse me that one comes out in the summer that's one on the right the fall form that actually overwinters and so here's another example of having a leaf pile or brush pile because that butterfly the actual adult butterfly survives the winter and becomes active in the spring and the summer brood um, that comes out in the summer is that uh, left one the summer form um, which to me doesn't make sense. You'd think the one that would be out in the winter in the cooler temperatures would have more dark coloration, but that's not the case on these. Uh, they feed on uh, elms and hackberries. Uh, Eastern comma is its close relative. Um, and these are have their names based on markings. And here I should have a picture of the underside of the wing. The question mark literally on the underside of the wing has a little hook with a dot of silver that make a question mark. And the eastern comma actually has like a little comma again on the underside. These are the upper sides of the butterflies. But the eastern comma is the same way. It's the adult butterfly that overwinters. And it's this form here. You can see in spring nectaring on service berry flowers. Um, this butterfly did overwinter. And again, its summer generation will be this one. And of course, the, the caterpillars of this feed on nettles and elms and hops. Um, those are actually a related group of plants and um, again, overwinters as an adult, emerging in the fall, which is kind of interesting. Morning cloak is in the same group and does the same thing. It's the actual adult butterfly that survives the winter, though many of ours do migrate south, um, all the way into Northern Texas. I remember when my sister lived in Northern Texas and we went out to get some firewood and there was a morning cloak in the wood pile. So, um, and they don't, 
um, they don't breed that far south, but they can, you know, migrate down there to spend the winter, though they are fully hardy way up, you know, into northern Minnesota as well, which is pretty interesting. Um, they're a butterfly that's called polyphagus. In other words, they eat all kinds of different things. And um, last summer at the Arboretum, they were actually, there were huge numbers of them actually defoliating some of our quaking aspen trees. There were so many caterpillars. Um, and of course, uh, the caterpillar makes a chrysalis and actually by midsummer emerges as a butterfly. Often it's, have you ever heard the term estivate? It's a butterfly that during the heat of summer may actually go into hibernation and then also hibernate again in the winter um, and, and again lay eggs in the spring and, and just one generation a, a year. So morning cloaks are actually one of our longest lived butterflies. Uh, we have the satyr group, something on butterflies. Northern pearly eye on Started the left. Seven. And the little wood in. satyr on the right. And I don't know. Somebody's got their microphone not turned off. Um, these are, if you have a more of a woodland garden and you plant woodland grasses. And at the end, I'll I have my list of my 25 favorite host plants to plant. Um, but it's actually the muley grasses that are one of the best. Um, Muhlenbergia is uh, some of the best for these in this area um, that their caterpillars feed on. And actually they overwinter as caterpillars as well. So there's another one where don't clean up your grass in the fall, um, your ornamental grasses, because that's where these caterpillars are, are hibernating for the next year. And of course, the beloved monarch are gateway species that inspires so many people. It's big and it's you know, it can be handled fairly easily. You can tag them. Uh, I hope you all know the, the first uh, recovery tag in Mexico that absolutely confirmed that monarchs migrate from the Midwest. Well, that butterfly was tagged here at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum by Jim Gilbert in, in the fall of 1975. Um, and that was the very first proof that we knew that the, my, the monarchs from the upper Midwest in Canada we're flying to those localized overwintering sites um, in you know, Mexico, west of Mexico City. Um, so monarchs, again, it doesn't matter what you, how you garden in the winter because they're gone, but we all know we have to plant milkweeds as that is the only host plant. And of course, it's the milkweeds that uh, have the toxin in them that is carried through to the caterpillar and the chrysalis and the but adult butterfly for its protection and, and, and the coloration and pattern of a monarch is all, all part of that scheme. Why, here we go. Um, the last family of butterflies are the skippers and how am I doing for time? I guess I'm okay. Um, and there actually are two groups of skippers, spread wing skippers and grass skippers, but these are the spread wing skippers. On the left, it almost looks like a brown moth, but it is a butterfly and um, a dusky wing. Uh, we have several species, but this is one that I get in my garden because I have columbine. Uh, the columbine dusky wing, the caterpillar will feed on nothing else but columbine mm -hmm. and oh. has a couple of broods a year. And, you know, it, um, it may look like a lot of other similar species. We have the juveniles dusky wing here, the sleepy dusky wing here sometimes the wild indigo dusky wing, and I can always identify it by it hanging around the columbine. Um, on the right is the silver spotted skipper, uh, probably our, well, it is our largest and showiest of the skipper family with that big silver spot on the hind wing and the big golden spot on the upper part. And it feeds on plants in the legume family, usually shrubs or vines, um, things like the indigo bush or the hog peanut vine. Um, that's what its caterpillar feeds on. And actually they're pretty easy to find because the caterpillar will roll a leaf around itself. So if you see that on those plants, um, pull it apart and you'll see the, the caterpillar hiding inside there. And for a little comic relief, it, it also, in its little sheltered lair, it, uh, you know, of course, all butterflies poop. It's called frass, by the way. Um, Silver-spotted skippers can shoot their, their frass out of that little uh, 
you know, leaf burrito that they're in. It's just an amazing distance, which they want to get their frass away from them because actually the, the scent from the frass is what attracts a lot of these predatory wasps. So an, an interesting adaptation on that one. The grass sk skippers, a lot of people are into, interested in butterflies, just kind of their eyes cross when they start to look at all the diversity of these little guys. Um, once you become interested in butterflies, you can start to learn the many species that we have in this area. My sad commentary is last summer in my garden, I had zero. I have never in my life, I mean, these, when I was a kid, how common the various grass skippers were, it's just almost embarrassing. And um, especially if you go north or south of here, you see them, you know, abundantly. And what the heck is going on in this immediate area? Um, is it all the all my neighbors spraying for the damn mosquitoes, killing everything, or you know the drift from all the soybean aphid spraying? I have no idea, but I have all the host plants. Um, kind of scares me. Um, here at the Arboretum, I did see some. You know, we have more natural areas um, here, and of course, we don't spray and or or are very 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 careful if we ever do on how we use things like that. But Lee Skipper on the left is a, more of a wetland specialist feeding on sedges. Um, one of the most common skippers is now the European skipper, another introduced one, but it feeds on Timothy. So it doesn't impact any of our native butterflies and actually likes hay fields. And of course, when farmers move hay around, they're just spreading European skippers and it's, it's too late. It's every, everywhere in the upper Midwest now. And the butterfly counts in northern Minnesota, this is often the most common butterfly. Um, and the satchum, a, a colonist from the south on our hot summer days um, that doesn't survive the winter on the right. But um, there are certain years where there's just thousands and thousands of those. But again, this last year, I had none in my yard of any species whatsoever. Um, one that looks just like a little wedge of chocolate is the dun skipper, and it feeds on uh, sedges. A lot of the woodland sedges actually are fine for it. Tawny edge skipper on the right will even feed on lawn grasses, and I didn't have a single one in my yard last summer. We've got to talk about moths, and here I am at uh, 742, and of course there's just a mind-boggling diversity of moths. Um, the silk moths, the giant silk moths are probably pretty well known by most gardeners. Um, the sphinx moths, the ones that fly like hummingbirds that come out at mostly at dusk, those are a few day flying ones, people really notice those. Um, and we'll just quickly go through some of these, um, some of the moths. Um, I like this picture from my porch light. There's 11 species in one shot, just kind of showing that diversity. And, and literally in the Midwest, there are over 20 species of moths for every species of butterfly. And of course, some of them are very, very tiny, like this little one here. Um, a lot of them called micro moths and the caterpillars actually feed inside the leaves of plants. And so when you see those little, <laughs> you know, um, borings inside your leaf, um, a lot of those are, are, are moths. And of course, here's the big giant silk moths, the luna moth being one of our most beloved. And that's another one that the, the cocoon has to winter in the leaf litter in contact with the ground to survive the winter period. Just try to overwinter one in a refrigerator in your house. Good luck for whatever reason, um, you know, it just, it just has to have those conditions. So there again, leave the leaves. Um, Luna's feed mostly on, in, in the metro, on bitternut hickory as the key host plant, but also walnut and butternut. And of course, in northern Minnesota, it will even be things like birches in northern Minnesota and Wisconsin. But in this area, it's generally plants in the walnut family. Um, the right, the Cecropia is one of those that'll just eat anything, polyphagous species um, with those huge caterpillars, um, always a striking character. Uh, Luna moths have two broods a year, which is pretty interesting. One, one comes out, you know, in the spring from the overwintering cocoon, and then of course has a brood uh, that, that literally just in 10 days or less hatches out in the summer to the summer brood. And then, then those, um, the caterpillars, that emerge from the eggs from those and um, make the cocoons that overwinter for the next year. Cecropias are just one, one brood a year. Um, so 
um, overwintering as a cocoon. That's a very tough cocoon. You can see it usually it's along the side of a stick or something and, and incredibly hardy. Here's our sphinx moths, a um, couple of the day flying ones on the left, the bumblebee and hummingbird clear wing moths, blinded sphinx, pink spotted hawk moth. There's actually, you know, in the upper 30s number of species of these in the Twin Cities metro, which to me their diversity is amazing. All of them have different host plants. Um, bumblebee clear wing, if you want those, you need honeysuckle. If you have the hummingbird clear wing, you got to have viburnums, blinded uh, sphinx, things like serviceberry and hawthorns, plums. Pink spotted hawk moth is actually one of those immigrants from the tropics, but you, if you plant like ornamental um, sweet potatoes, that's what it will feed on our morning glories. Whoops, and here's just some caterpillar. The caterpillar diversity of sphinxes are really interesting, but they almost always have that horn on the end. So the tomato hornworm is in that group. Um, underwing moths, and here it jumped back to that. Uh, Pandora sphinx is a grape specialist, grape and Virginia creeper. Hermit sphinx on your monardas. And um, then we have the Carolina sphinx, which feeds on things in the tobacco family. Um, this group are the underwing moths. Um, they're called that because when they have their wings closed, they have a very barkish pattern that's very cryptic. And, and when they're um, when you disturb them, they have these bright colors underneath, um, and they think that's an adaptation to startle predators to get away. If you have a butterfly feeder or moth feeder at night, they will come in droves to um, rotting fruit. Um, this one is uh, the white underwing. I, can you guess? It's a birch specialist. <laughs> Here it landed on an elm tree so you could see it, but when it lands on a birch tree, it blends in perfectly. And of course, I already talked enough about how important the leafy layer is for many of our insects, many of our butterflies and moths, of course, my backyard. Um, and yes, a lot of species, even actually the caterpillars eat the dead leaves. So the tritophagus is actually the word. There's your new word for the day. Um, and these idias, uh, idia moths are classics for that. So. Um, real important decomposers and, of course, important in the food chain. And these, these four pictures were all taken by Bill Johnson, who lives in the Bryn Mawr neighborhood of Minneapolis in his garden. And, you know, the importance of leaving wood and fallen um, branches and limbs in your yard is really critical as well. A lot of people don't think of that. So here we're talking about, if you're talking mostly about host plants, it takes more. Um, these are all beautiful moths and in the lower left a couple species of bees that absolutely have to have wood. The grapevine epimenus, the ape spotted forester, um, the beautiful wood nymph, and the Harris's three spot. Look at that funkadoodle caterpillar. It looks like a bird dropping. Um, but the only way it'll pupate is if it can burrow into some soft wood to pupate to overwinter. How amazing is that? So if you're cleaning up your woods and not leaving any wood around for these things, for these caterpillars to burrow into to survive the winter, you're also failing as a good gardening for Lepidopterist. And of course, some of the host plants aren't even vascular plants. We have at least two species of lichen moths. The caterpillars actually feed on mosses and lichens, which is pretty amazing. The beautiful scarlet and painted lichen moths there in the middle. And inchworms, I think everyone knows that the picture in the middle there is one of the, the uh, juniper twig geometer, ju juniper in inchworm that feeds only on the red cedar. We have the blackberry loop or one of the pretty green ones that feeds on blackberries, uh, cross-lined wave in the same group. And you know, just some candy. I know uh, uh, the beautiful diversity of our moth caterpillars is just mind-boggling to me. There's the curved line outlet. I just saw the moth, showed you the moth before. Um, or excuse me, the cross-lined waved is the left one. The curved line outlet is a, is above. It looks like a bird dropping that's dripping. Um, and the funky brown hooded outlet feeding on the um, zigzag goldenrod there. Look at the coloration of that. Uh, funerary dog or uh, dagger moth, uh, also called the rose paddle caterpillar, feeds on wild roses, woolly gray. I mean, it just, the diversity is mind boggling. But, you know, 
if you have those house plant or host plants and you provide the right habitat and the nectar plants, you know, if you plant it, they will come. And this is my butterfly feeder, actually in my Missouri garden. Um, but I'll put scraps of all, you know, watermelon rinds, peach pits, old bananas, anything like that, I would throw in there. It's uh, actually just a hanging bird bath I got at Wild Birds Unlimited on a nylon cord, uh, hanging on a nylon cord. Have to use that, otherwise the raccoons can shimmy down it. But um, amazing what that'll attract. And of course, all of you as wild ones know um, the importance of natural landscaping, you know, in removing invasive plants, no pesticides, no fertilizers, well, no fertilizers. And um, this is my front yard in Chaska, and it has become an oasis. And I do have a great diversity of butterflies, though, I mean, it is nothing in this area compared to where I lived in Missouri. Um, literally, probably I've, I've been there five years and there's certainly days in um, Missouri where I've seen as many butterflies as I've seen in five years here, which is kind of shocking. But hopefully that's a call to action for all of you to start this type of gardening um, and you know, create a better world to bring our butterflies back. And here's my list of my top 25 host plants I would recommend um, for attracting various butterflies in your yard. Um, and some of them, you know, again, I couldn't touch on all the butterflies in this area. We have a phenomenal diversity. And of course the moth diversity is off the charts. Um, but I hope this gave you a taste of just this, in, in, you know, incredible resource of Lepidoptera we have and um, gave you some new tips and ideas for how you can garden in your yard. You can take pictures of this, and obviously this is being recorded. Uh, I think that's my, my last slide is just this one of looking at a, a little weepy area in bark, and there's some hackberry emperors and underwing moths uh, sipping up the nectar or, or sipping up the sap flow there. So anyway, we can go to questions. And yeah, I, I, I got done in, I got nine minutes to spare. <laughs> Well, very Howard. good, Alan. Yeah, <laughs> what people can unmute and um, ask questions, but everybody be polite and take your turn. So if you have questions for Alan, this is a good time to, to go for it. And very good job, Alan. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I, I really love being in person and I wish we could do that again. Um, well, one day. One day, I know. So we have a, a, a question in the chat. Can you recommend any books other than your own? You can recommend your own and any others that you uh, want. Well, it, um, for butterfly gardening, um, the, the one um, by the North American Butterfly Association, I think it is just called Butterfly Gardening. Um, what's her name? Jane Horowitz. Um, that is a, a really good one. Um, probably the best. Uh, the Xerces Society has a pretty good one as well. So for gardening, for identification, it's the Kaufman Guide or the Swift Guide to Butterflies that I, I think are the, the two best. Okay, if, if, if you can follow along in chat, there's a new question in chat if you want to look at it. I don't know why I can't, why those are not showing up for me is... It should be on the bottom of your... I screen. need to hit escape. There, I need to hit escape the program. So um, what suggestions do you have for those who use mulch in the garden? Well, again, just leave the mulch, um, but leave the leaves on the mulch. Um, I'm sorry, I've become Mulch Lovers Anonymous. I just use you know, all the natural organic scraps from the garden as the mulch and, you know, chopping up trees for that is kind of ridiculous, to be honest with you. So um, I, I don't, I think that's more for uh, paths and things like that. And I prefer people use natural, um, the natural organic matter from the plants and trees and so on in your garden. Good, thank you. Another question in the chat? Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, I only have black walnut. What can I grow around it that help leopards adapt to walnut toxin? The walnut toxin is um, most of our native plants, of course, are adapted to that. So uh, most of the spring ephemeral wildflowers, even violets, are unscathed by that. So um, 
gosh, vir virtually everything I have on that plant list that's shade tolerant is also tolerant of walnut toxins. It's more like if you're growing a vegetable garden and you've got issues. And of course we have like the Luna moth as a walnut host. Um, and there are several other moths. Um, yeah, I, the, the note there about shredded mulch can be a carrier for jumping worms. That's another reason, um, unless you know, you know you've got something that's been treated um, heat, heat treated so that those cocoons don't survive and get carried over. Um, let me see, did I miss any other chat? No, no, and there's time for more questions if you want to put them in the chat or, or unmute. Oh, I can't find the chat, but I have a question. Sure. As far as the great fritillary, yeah. um, what kind of violets? Is it the blue violet? or will they go to white violets or what violets do they like? I know it's not like the hybrid ones you get in the um, nurseries, but. Um, right, they they prefer any of the native. They will, I've seen them use the white, you know, the, the whole blue complex, even the yellow. Um, so any of those will work. I have not ever seen them on violas, pansies or the sweet violet. Um, so those don't work for the great spangled fritillary. The great, the variegated fritillary, which is a colonist in this area, will use um, pansies and violas, but not the great spangled. And you had another question in the chat. Okay, I got to scroll down to see it. Is it harmful to rake some of the leaves to the side? Um, it's it isn't, especially if you have like really heavy caked windblown leaves, um, removing that top layer usually that has no impact. They're usually on the lower, the lower base area. So um, yeah, I will, when I have really, really dense leaf areas, I will pull those out. Um, I actually usually rake them out and then um, go over them with the mulching mower um, so that they go down usually into my turf areas or I can rake them into wherever um, I have a, where I need more of that. Well, we have time for more questions. Any more, any more questions? Alan, you've been really, really good and patient. We appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. And Here's maybe another. I did go too fast. <laughs> no, you did, you did just right. Here's another question in the chat. And I know it's it's a lot to cover. Okay, I pick and feed cabbage white caterpillars to the chickadees. Is that okay? Yes, it is okay. Um, I actually like that. So <laughs> the chickadees probably love you as well. So, and obviously that's one of our invasive butterflies. The cabbage white is non-native and then that um, skipper. And unfortunately we have a third one getting here any day. The European common blue got away in Quebec and now is abundant around Toronto, found in New York and Vermont. And they expect it to cross at Detroit and be in Michigan. And before you know it, it'll be here. So we'll have another, another non-native butterfly. And then there's even a lime swallowtail related to the giant swallowtail from Asia that got away at a butterfly house in, in uh, the Dominican Republic and has already spread to um, Puerto Rico and Jamaica and Aruba and threatening some, actually some of these um, you know, endemic swallowtails, and they feel that it's going to jump to the Keys and go up Florida, and they expect it to be hardy, and <laughs> we will have a new swallowtail. So as you know, I think all of us understand how we have to be careful with non-native species. Okay, there's at least three more questions. In the oh, sorry. I... No, it's okay. Emerald ash borer treatment. Oh, that's a, that's a dangerous one. It, it's one of those complex ones. Actually, one of the best treatments is one of the pesticides we don't want to use, imidacloprid, which is bad for bees, is actually very one of the best things that doesn't impact caterpillars. So that is very challenging. And, and I actually, I am, I, I need to get back with you on that, on how some of these others are faring. You know, we have the state champion green ash here at the Arboretum, and of course, we already started treatment. Um, and I didn't even talk about that. You know, there are some moth specialists that we are very concerned with, one of them being the um, great ash sphinx uh, moth, the, the sphinx moth. Um, it, it is a canopy feeder. So, and of course, emerald ash borer is going to impact the large ash trees and, and the smaller ones, not so much. Um, so we'll have concerns on that. 
Um, intrigued by the idea of a butterfly feed, feeder. Um, I did talk about it. Um, Jane Horwitz did interview me for that NABA butterfly gardening book. And of course, my garden was featured in it um, in Missouri. Um, and, I, and, I, and it's covered really well in that um, publication. Um, but yeah, you, you want to hang them so that, you know, a lot of like possums and raccoons can't get to them. You don't really necessarily want them right by your patio where you sit out because they also do attract wasps and other things that may be a nuisance to you. So, um, just keep the, those types of things in mind. Um, and yeah, what kinds of scraps? Yeah, fruit scraps. Um, uh, bananas are, are one of the favorites, uh, cantaloupes, watermelon rinds, um, mangoes, <laughs> butterflies go crazy for ripe mangoes or even just the pit left over or the peels um, put out there. And of course you let it all, you know, brew up um, and, you know, it's butterflies, butterflies like that. It, it is, I didn't even talk about that, you know, many species actually prefer to eat things like rotten fruit and get nutrients and minerals from dung and tree sap and things like that. So it kind of fills that niche. I think that, did I scroll down? I think that covers the yeah, chat. Uh, yeah, we have time for one or two more questions. Alan's been really patient, but you know, as long as you're here and he's here, you might as well ask questions if you have them. Well, I love that you had 50 participants. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I actually this? counted 59 at one time, which is, okay. which is very good. And I, I think everybody appreciated your presentation. Um, if there's no more questions, then um, I, I think we can um, give Alan a little break and at least let him get home. So <laughs> if there's no, no more questions, why don't we uh, adjourn? All right. Well, hey, thank, thank you, everybody. Well, thank you, Alan. You did you did a very good job. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank You're very you. Welcome. And and nice to e meet you, Howard, as well. Yes, fellow Iowa Stater. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. There aren't that many of them. <laughs> and when you All get right. a nickname like the Cyclones, you know it doesn't doesn't help any. <laughs> all right. Take care. All have a great evening. Okay. Thank you all very much. I'm going to stop recording. Yep. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.